We play and call it work. Hey everybody, Matthew and Steve here from AnyWargaming.com and welcome to this episode of our Age of Sigmar second edition coverage. We are incredibly excited oh, yeah. for this. Oh, like, yeah. I don't think I've been excited, uh, this excited for something since 40k hit 8th hit edition. Yep. Like it's been a whole oh, year since I've been this excited. Now, I've had lots of fun moments between then and now, but I just, I'm just so excited for Age of Sigmar 2nd yeah. Edition. This first video, we are going to be looking at da, 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 the core rulebook and talking about everything, everything that has changed between 1st and 2nd Edition. So if you've been following Warhammer Community or following other places where they show you different changes, Look at this video as a collection of all of that. I've gone through and underlined everything that's changed from first to second. Now, we're just going to be covering the core rules in this video. We're not going to be talking about the General's Handbook or Malign Sorceries or the narrative, open and match play, oh, pitch so battles, much. all that so kind of stuff. Much. A lot of that has changed too. Yep. Match play has definitely changed. We're going to be covering that in another video. But we're just going to be focus on the core rules that you'll have in all of your games because there are some subtle but major changes to the game that I think you're really going to notice. And we've already played a couple games. By this point, I've played two games of Age of Sigmar in the second edition, and mm -hmm. you've played one. And we've, we haven't used the New General's Handbook and Blind Sorceries in those games, so our minds are only on what changed here. So we're not clouded with... Well, it's also this allegiance ability that changed, and I cast this Malign Sorceries thing, and so when I was determining who's going first, that was a big change. None yeah. of that was influencing what we're talking about today. It's just pure core rules. And uh, for our Vault members, we got a special treat for you. After you're finished watching this, there's a link in the video description to go and watch a review. Now that we've played some games of Age of Sigmar 2nd Edition, we want to give you our first impressions on what it's like and how much we like it. And so that'll be in the Mini Wargaming Vault at the link below. If you're not a Vault member, now is the time to get into it because we are going to be putting out a ton of Age of Sigmar 2nd Edition videos. Don't worry, 40k lovers, we're still putting out the same number of 40k videos that we have before. So if you think we're putting out less, you're wrong. It just <laughs> looks like it because we'll be putting out so many Age of Sigmar so videos much. at the same time. But uh, if this is the time to try out the Vault, you can click the link, go get a free 7-day trial because today, which is the first day of our coverage, there's four videos going up. This video, that first impressions video I just told you about, and two Age of Sigmar 2nd Edition Battle Reports. And those ones will include the new General's Handbook 2018 and probably the Malign Sorceries. We haven't filmed them yet, so I can't say exactly what they are. <laughs> but they will all be in the links below. So our Vault members will get the extra Battle Report, they'll get the first impressions, and over the course of the next few weeks, you're going to get a ton. Faction focuses, or foci as we like to call them, and foci. Foci, foci is also correct. It depends which world, or part of the world you're from, or what you know age you're from. It's true. <laughs> like 200 years ago or something. <laughs> and we're going to be doing how to play. We're going to be doing traveling through the realms. I'm, that's a series that I'm, I'm going to be hosting. So excited for that one to be honest with you. Yeah. If you ever wondered what the heck are the realms like, traveling through the realms is going to give you a nice detailed look at the day in the life and the, what the realms actually look like. And then we're going to do battle reports with each of those in those realms because there's rules for it in here. That is awesome, actually. We're not talking about that today, though. Okay. I know you're excited. I we're want gonna, to talk about that. We'll get we are going to be making a separate video on uh, the changes to match play and also on battling in the realms. So you can look forward to those on another day. So there's just so much to cover that we had to pick something. And I think the most important thing to answer on day one, what has changed? Yeah, for sure. Are you ready? Let's do this. Okay. So let's open up the book. The massive not four-page booklet. Yeah, well, you know what? Okay, I think that's that, that. Let's talk about that for a second. The book is a little thicker than it used to be. Oh yeah, it's no longer four pages. But <laughs> don't be alarmed by that. It's all good. This right up to here is uh, lore. There is like two hundred plus pages of lore. The world is shaping, or the realms are shaping. Yeah, the realms are shaping. <laughs> they actually have maps in here of the realms. They really describe four of the realms really well: life, death, metal, and fire. Uh, they go into some detail of the other ones as well, but uh, hopefully those ones will get more developed in future stuff as well. And then the book actually contains open play, narrative play, and match play, whereas that used to be in a general's handbook. Right. And it also has a new um, part that has the... Um, there's a new way to play, which ha it's kind of like the tactical objectives for 40K, yes. where there's 36 objectives that you roll on the fly as you're playing the game. It's not actually... That's not in the match play. 
as, as it was as it is in 40k. That's all part of match play, but it's not in this one. It's a separate way. But that's all in here now. So that's really cool that that's all in there. But we're going to be focusing on page. Hold on, here we are. 226, the core rules. So the very first thing that we know that's changed is the core rules are no longer four pages long. No, no, there's a bit more rules here. Were the core rules ever really four pages long, though? Well, uh, if you say it that way, the answer is yes, because the core rules were four pages of a pamphlet, but all the rules were in the War Scrolls. That's not even what I'm thinking about. What I'm thinking about is the FAQ that came out to clarify all the ambiguities right, that came up in the core rules. To, to defend the four-page meme, like that was out for a good while before we had that FAQ to change all things. That's why the, that's why we hang out of this four-page meme. Honestly, we all know it's never been four pages of rules, uh, but we hang out of that joke forever because that's how it was in the beginning. Well, it's things like they didn't specify where to measure from. Right. And so they had all sorts of questions about, the, you know, bases didn't matter. Or actually, they did specify that you measured from the model. And so all of a sudden, you had these, all these weird scenarios of, you know, the model that's up here and another one that's down here. And they can't even reach each other. And the FPQ had to come out and be like, well, yeah, I guess they can't fight each other. But this guy can fight a guy up on a ledge. And they had to ex they had to explain so many things. There was a bunch of little weird things like that. Just how your wing can be over a force and you're in cover. But, I mean, like, once General's Handbook uh, 2017 came out, all that changed. Or 2016 is actually the first one. Was it 2016? Yeah. This is this is getting old now. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, so 2016. Yeah, so that added all the actual rules. Ever since, since then, it's not been a four-page game. Exactly. And it's interesting to note that it's now, I believe, eight pages. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, you can include nine if you put the train in there, because that was in the yeah, original four. Would. And so, let's say it's eight to nine pages now. And the nice thing about this, as I've noticed as we've gone through, is it's not going to require nearly as much of an FAQ or errata to make it clear. There are a couple spots. We've already talked to some of the guys at Games Workshop, and we've gotten clarifications. So, um, because there was a couple ambiguities. Yes. But um, overall, I think it's... It was that big debate about uh, going, like, going first. Going first in the first yeah. round, which we will talk about. And so, yeah, this whole idea, I've never liked this whole idea of let's make a four-page rule book. I've always been against that. This game is not simple enough. Star Wars X-Wing could try to get away with that. It's a simple game. Yeah. But this game, there's, there's too much to it. And so I think that the problem with that is you've pushed too many rules to the War Scrolls, and so now you're constantly referencing the War Scrolls. A good example of that, they actually put the garrison rules here in this book. Right. Whereas it's spread throughout a bunch of war scrolls in the different uh, scenery war scrolls that you could garrison. And they're all written the same way. And so those ones, they probably keep those in the war scrolls, but they could have just say it has the garrison special rule. And then kind of like fly. This model can fly. And then all the rules for fly are in the core rule book. So they don't have to reiterate those right. over and over and over Like and over if you again. include all the pages for all the scenarios and all that kind of stuff as well, this is as thick as the 8th edition for sure. Rule yeah. Rule-wise. Rule-wise. For sure. Yeah, exactly. It's not just, he said 8 pages, he's right, 8 pages of the core rules. We include everything you need to play the game. It's as big as 8th edition Warm 40k. Exactly. Yeah, because in these 8 or 9 pages, they don't actually tell you how to play a game. Right. They, they tell you the phases, but they don't tell you how to set up and deploy. Whereas that was in the 4 pages. Yes, Four pages, was. I was like, yeah, divide it, it in was. half and go at it. Um, they don't even tell you how many wounds. They, now, mind you, they, they tell you how to play without giving you much of a, a, a structure, but this one doesn't even tell you how to play. It just yeah. gives you the phases. So technically, it's not nine pages. It's probably a couple more than that if you just include a couple of the open play ones. So my point is, thankfully, they've abandoned this whole four-page idea. On top of that, one thing I noticed is there's no columns. Okay, so I was going to bring it up. I was going to hope... Okay, you got it. You got, right. Okay, you I'll, say I'll, You I'll talk about it okay. You talk about so, it. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are familiar with 8th edition Warmer 40K, uh, often uh, you're looking up a rule and you can't find it. You know you read it somewhere, but you can't find the rule because you keep putting a bunch of things in columns, like little areas that used to be reserved for fluff, for narrative type stuff, became little blurbs of rules in the 8th edition Warmer 40K rule book. Not this book. It's all... It's in the rules. Nice. It's all, you, you You can go find the rule you're looking for. It's well put together. This book is really well put together when you compare it to the 8th edition of Warm 40K one. Uh, you, you're not hunting for a rule. You didn't remember reading one little paragraph somewhere you have to go find it. Or you, and then you, you never find it because it's on the, a different page related to something nothing, else. Nothing to do with anything. Or you, didn't, you probably didn't miss a rule because you, there's no little side columns that you, didn't, you skipped over. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with 40K, <laughs> none of that will really matter to you. All I'm trying to say is, we it's actually going through this. I'm like, oh, well this, is, this is well written. It's really nice. 
So for the most part. So let's go through it. We're going to now give you the list of everything that's changed, just yes. starting at page 226 and working our way through. And so if we don't mention something, you can assume that it has not changed. Right. Now, if you've already got the rule book somehow, or you have a comment, and you think that we missed something, we'd love to hear from you in the comments below. For because sure. that's kind of a big deal. If there is a change that we didn't catch, then, well, we've probably already filmed like a dozen games by the time you catch it, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but we're, I, I'm pretty sure that we've caught everything. It's pretty straightforward. I, I spent a lot of time putting this side by side Just going with the original ones and going, <laughs> you can see where they just copied and pasted and then where they made changes. So, let's go back and forth. Yes. We're just going to go, I'll, I'll start, and then we'll just kind of flip the pages, and you take the next one. Let's do it. And we'll just, that's our format. That way I make sure I'm not the one doing all the talking. because I'm okay with not talking. I know, sometimes I, I talk a lot. No, no, that's, that's inaccurate. I always talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of what we do, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, the very first thing, this is kind of a minor thing, because mostly everybody's been doing it anyways, but now it's official, is that measuring distances is between the closest points of the bases of the models you're measuring to and from. It's funny, yeah. when I mentioned, when I first got this book, and I mentioned to Steve, oh, you measure base to base now, Steve was like, oh, that is official now. And I'm like, like no, it's not. And he's like, yeah, it totally is. Um, and then you thought it was. Yeah. And then I looked up the general's handbook, and it said, under house rules, yeah. you're welcome to put house rules in. For example, a common house rule is that you measure base to base. So the greater AOS community has adopted that. Of course. So now it's officially official. Now it is officially official. Like <laughs> even the Games Workshop events were doing base to yeah. base. Yeah, like no more of that uh, spit in your spear. Yeah, exactly. And so that's minor, but yeah. I, I'm glad that it's been adopted as it has that stamp of, well, now, now you can't get away with not doing now we can't. Now we can't joke about, but yeah, it, 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 it was, that was a bad call the other way. Okay, so that's the first one. Oh, you gave me this one. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll just read up um, uh, during deployment. Uh, I'll, I'll read it. I'll read it. Okay, so at the start of each battle round, the player must roll off, and the winner decides to take the first turn. If the roll-off is a tie, then the player who went first last battle round can choose who goes first in this one. That's new. Uh, but if the first battle round... Uh, I don't have to read any farther. Oh, okay, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, but if it is the first battle round, the player that finished setting up their army first chooses who sets up the uh, chooses who has the first turn. That's two separate things. Yeah, it looks like one long sentence. We've confirmed this with Games Workshop. So I thought I was talking about the second one. No, no. Yeah, I didn't realize they were both side by side sentence wise. Okay, the first one. Uh, if the roll off the tide, then the player who went first in the last battle round can choose who goes first. So random turns. We're rolling off. Let's say Matthew went first, turn one. We roll off for turn two. It's a tie. He has to go. I get to choose. He, he went, I get well, to choose. Sorry, yeah, you get to choose. The tie chooses. Uh, so there's a slightly less chance of a double turn. I don't want to give any spoilers, but no. I don't want to give you spoilers. It comes up. It comes up. It comes up. Let me put it this way. It comes up. Um, I'm not going to say how long I've had these rules, but I've known about them for a little bit. And the a lot of the first edition games that I played, every single game except one, we rolled doubles at least once. And there was even one game with Quirk where we rolled doubles three times in a row. I can't explain it, but if you go back in any of the battle reports, it's so often that it's a, it's a tie. On, on, it's on only a one level. in six chance it's a tie. <laughs> but you are, so rolling it, you are rolling it uh, usually four times in a game. Yeah. So it is going to come up, and it is game-changing. And I, we're not going to be getting into how the endless spells work, which will combine with changing how the random turn thing will affect the game. So let's just forget that for a second. That's a whole separate conversation. Just the fact that, um, actually, in, in one of our games, I don't know if it was with you or Luca, because we played, basically the games that we played already were the finale for uh, our Illaras Awakening. So the ones coming out this coming Saturday are in second edition, which is nice. And we rolled off, and but before I rolled first before he'd rolled his die, and I had gone first in the first turn, and I rolled a six. And that, that feeling of, it's mine. He rolled a two, that so it didn't Luca, matter. Yeah. That was with Luca. So it didn't matter in the end, but it was that sense of, I rolled a six, and I didn't get the frustration of him then rolling a six, and then re-rolling something really right. bad. So as soon as I rolled that six, I knew I had it. I could not fail it. And on the, on the other side, if you're the one that went second, if you roll a one before your opponent even rolls, you know you've lost. And it it's only one in six chance but it does have an influence. So what's definitely. the percentage of uh, choosing the ro winning the roll off if you win ties? Sixty something. Well, it becomes higher than fifty percent. Yeah. So it, it, it's a little better. It's a little better. Yeah, it's going to be like fifty-five, between fifty-five and sixty. It's not going to be as high as sixty. I'm not as high. But either way, it's a little better. It's not like uh, we have a slightly smaller chance of the double turn. Yeah. 
Maybe. But then, but then, if you win the double turn, it's slightly harder for you to get the second double turn. Yeah, it, it does change it. Yeah. Now, the but part we've all seen plenty of ties. Now, talk about the part that needs the epic key yeah. that we know the answer to. We don't, yes, it's true. Uh, so, okay, but if it's the first battle round, the player that finished setting up their army first chooses who has the first turn. So we're talking after deployment. Uh, what does that mean? Are you asking me? Yeah. Okay. Well, when <laughs> no. you read it, because of the comma, it says, if it's a tie, then whoever went first gets to choose, comma, but if it's the first battle round, then whoever finished setting up first gets to choose. So when you read it, you can read this one of two ways. You can read it as you still roll off in the first battle round. And if it's a tie. And if it's a tie, then whoever finished setting up first gets to choose who goes first. And I was excited for that. I'm like, sweet, they got rid of the whole whoever finishes deploying first right. gets to go for or choose who goes first. But I double checked with Games Workshop yeah. and that is not the case. And in fact, you'll probably I'm guessing there will be like a FAQ very, very soon. It would have to be. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a day one FAQ for the pre-order, or maybe it's already out by the time this video comes out, that does clarify that. Or maybe there was a, a Warhammer community spot that, that does talk about that. So I know you, you can easily debate it. Yeah, very easily. easily. We had a long conversation about it before I got it confirmed. But the answer is the first battle round, it is still who finished setting up first that chooses who goes first. Which, unfortunately, because this is the only section I'm going to even talk about, unfortunately, because the rest of it, I love everything. But unfortunately, I th it would have been pretty cool if it was you rolled before the game even started and whoever rolls higher picks who goes first, unless it was a tie, then the person who deployed first gets to choose. Yeah, so there like, is That would have been cool. That would have been cool. Yeah. Except for he just gets, the person who finished deploying first just gets to choose every time. And so that's not changing, and it is what it is. Yeah. And so you have to plan for that. Yeah. It does, well, I, one thing I did notice with this, throughout the whole book is that War Scroll Battalions are getting even more buffs in the sense that um, we're going to talk about command points soon. They get an extra command point. Yep. So that whole deploying first is still a big thing for them. I'm starting to see more and more reasons why I want to pay the points cost for War Scroll Battalions. Right. This is just one more of them. Uh, there's plenty of War Scroll Battalions out there where you're like, okay, I'll, I can pay anywhere from 60 to 200 extra points for a battalion, but I don't really care about those rules that much. But no longer am I just paying those points just for that battalion special rules. I need it for command points. I need it for draw, yeah. draw, like plenty of good reasons. Yeah, exactly. So since that rule didn't change, essentially, and I have gone through all the, at least the match play scenarios, and none of them override that. So don't think, well, maybe the scenario specifically will override it. None of them override it. Right. So you are still usually using that basic. Uh, if you want to make your own custom scenarios, you do whatever you want. If you uh, watch my narrative campaign, a lot of times I either gave the turn to the protagonist or, we, straight up roll or off. we actually straight up roll off. In fact, when we're deploying, if you could watch us deploy, <laughs> it's like, just put your stuff on the table. <laughs> and I'm just like, ba da 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 And we're both deploying at the same time. And then we rolled off our first turn. And then the game's fantastic. Like, it was still fantastic, right? Yep. But if you're playing like tournaments, you're definitely going to want to. But we're be. often deploying narratively. Exactly. Like this character wants to be heading over. Or here. the last games that we just played were over 3,000 points. And I just deployed where I could fit stuff because there's so many models on the table. It's true. It's true. It's so true. let's go into the hero phase. The big change in the hero phase is actually a huge change, and that is uh, command points and new command abilities. We have command yeah. points, but not if you're a 40k player. Pretty much nothing like the other ones. There are some similarities yeah. in some of the things. When you look at some of the command abilities you can use them for, it kind of feels a bit like stratagems. But uh, you don't get nearly as many command points as you do in um, 40, uh, 40k. At least not yet. I don't know. I hope, right. they, I hope it doesn't escalate over the next year. And people find tons of ways. Now I can bring five command points right at the beginning. Essentially, you start the game with zero command points. And you get plus one for every War Scroll Battalion that you have. So you start with, you have two War Scroll Battalions, you start the game with two command points. This is important distinction. You start with zero. In each of your hero phases, you gain one. So if you have no battalions and your opponent goes first, then right at that moment, you don't have any command points. This is important because the command points are used for activating your command abilities. And you have your regular command abilities, and so now it's no longer just your general who can use their command right, ability. Right, that's really good too. And But you still have to decide. So there, there's so many times that I played where first turn, I'm like, oh, okay, I'll use my command ability. Uh, like if I'm playing Iron Jaws, the, the, their WA thing, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to use that one, so uh, you guys are immune to battle shock. Right. Because why not? Right. Now it's like, you know what, no, nope, I'm holding on to that command point because they carry over. And if I have two command points and I had two mega bosses, and they were in different spots, I could activate both of their command abilities at the same time. Furthermore, they have added three new command abilities. One yep. is a modification, it's Inspiring Presence, and um, now any hero can use it. It doesn't have to even be a hero with a command ability. So all your heroes all of a sudden have three command abilities, at the double, forward to victory, and Inspiring Presence. Start with Inspiring Presence, 
The range is 6 inches for a hero, 12 inches for your general. You use it in the battle shock phase, right. including your opponent's battle shock phase. This is why it's important to note that in the first turn you don't have any command points during your opponent's turn. That you can, instead of saying beforehand in the hero phase, this guy's immune to battle shock, now you can hold on to that. And during the battle shock phase, you can be like, okay, before we start rolling for battle shock, that unit that's within 12 inches of my general, I'm going to spend a command point. He passes. Now, Luke and I have been debating this one for a while. He thinks it's not as good. I think it's better. I think we have to play a bunch of games to decide. There are pros and cons to it. Right. The pros being that you don't waste it on something and then afterwards need it. Like a game that I played against Luca that's already up in the vault, there was one point where he put Inspiring Presence on his big block of zombies. And you don't no, want sorry, on his, on his big block of... Yeah, no, his big block of skeletons, or his grave guard. And so I, fo- so I focused all my attention on his, on his zombies instead, right. who were not immune to battle shock. Whereas, if, and his general was within 12 inches of both of them at that time. So he could have saved that command point. I would have just had to fight, and he'd be like, okay, you just killed 20 of my 60 zombies. Command so point, I want 40 of those guys to stick around. Before this book, Inspiring Presence was essentially, um, I'm going to pick a unit which you're probably going to ignore. Yeah, or you're going to have to kill down to nothing. To the man, yeah. Either if you're going to you're going to try to kill them all, or you're just going to have to ignore them. So in the sense, the it only works once, and so that's where it's weaker. So it's whereas inspiring presence in first edition, you put it on a unit, and they were inspiring presence until your next hero phase. So if your opponent got a double turn, they were just they were just sitting there inspiring presence the whole time. Yeah. And so that could come into effect multiple times. So I, I like it better this way. I really do. Well, the other thing to consider for the pro, too, is all of your heroes can do it. So now you have a hero way over here with your general way over here, and this guy's near this big block of units, or of, uh, of yeah, of your models. All of a sudden, he can give them Inspiring Presence. Well, you no too. longer have one big block fighting your opponent's one big block. Now you can start you know, playing around the you table can, more. Yeah. I'm sure there'll still be synergy where you want to keep things close together. Of course. But uh, that, this gives you more options of being a little more um, independent. The other two, at the double, this happens in the movement phase. So this is the other thing. These command abilities, none of them are in the hero phase. So you can hold on. You make a run roll. You don't like it. Spend a command point if they're within 6 inches of a hero or 12 inches of your general, and you change that die to a 6. So an auto run of 6. That You've used on. it. That, uh, we've used it it's already. It's come up and it's made a big deal. Big difference. Rolled a roll. Yeah. I, in, in a game that I played, I rolled a 1, and I needed a 6. And so I spent the command point, moved up, uh, I had an ability to run and charge because I was playing Nurgle with their Feculent and Aramaz, and I was able to get into combat, yep. and it made a big difference yep. in the game. Took that really slow army and just shot him across yeah, the table. Yeah, exactly. And then the other one is forward to victory. It's the same idea. This is in the charge phase, that if you fail a charge, you can spend a command point if they're within 6 inches of a hero or 12 inches of your general, and re-roll the failed charge. Now, where this really differs from 40k is you've got to use these sparingly. Yeah. You do not, like, even if... Even if you have three war scrolls at the beginning, that'll be a lot of command points, but you only generate one per hero phase. So it's only like this little buffer at the beginning. Yeah. There are a, a couple things I've seen here or there, command traits that let you get your command point back on a 5+, plus, kind of similar to the Ultramarines. But when you only have one or two, it's not like the Ultramarines having 10, turning 10 into like 13 or 14. It's when you only have a couple, that 5+, plus is not going to cascade as much. And I'm sure they'll introduce other things. I hope not too much. Well, so even in this book, I don't know if you caught it, um, in the, in the Grand, Allegi- Grand Allegiances, well, one of the changed ones for order is you just get one more command point. So you, yeah, and I've seen that a couple of places where you just start with an extra command point. Yeah. And that's a big deal without being a big deal. It'll be, yeah. it'll be handy. But I'm going to try to buy more models to make battalions now. Intentionally, for, for command points. Yeah, because that 150-point battalion where you're like, ah, so much. Now you're getting 150 points, and that'll get you all the special rules of the battalion. Gets you the extra artifact if you're playing match play. Uh, gets you the extra command point, And but, it helps you to drop faster because you can choose to drop them all at the same time. But there are plenty to. of cheaper ones, too, like at 100 or under 100 points as well. So like those are the ones I'm going mean, to be striving for because the bigger ones tend to give you some cool abilities. But at least those other ones, which you tend to ignore previously, you're taking for command points now, yeah. and they're well worth it. Hey, your units are still restricted to being in only in one battalion, so unless it's yeah. a battalion of battalions, which that would be interesting if you're doing a battalion that oh. has battalions and you get a yeah, lot of command points. But you didn't. You're playing three thousand point oh, games. Oh no, at that you're point. playing like five thousand. Yeah, most of them. yeah, most of those are yeah. big games, <laughs> unless you're min maxing and everything. But if you're finding a way to min max, then you're going to have problems elsewhere. In the right, game. like you probably take the thirty-seven command points. Not a big deal. <laughs> Um, let, I'll let you talk about all the movement phase stuff because there's a bunch of little ones in there. Okay. So just ignore that one. Just do that one and that one right there. All right, so in the movement phase, we got here. Uh, oh, so uh, what's, is word clearancy? 
Yeah, coherency. So there's a six inch vertical coherency now in the game, which I don't think, if it, you probably remember better than me, there was no talk of that whatsoever previously. It was always just one inch. So if we had a ledge that was two inches, you could not split your unit between the two sides of that ledge. Now, often uh, you played in a flat surface. Well, okay, when I talk, when I say often, when I'm talking about like you know, way back when the game first started, I know we use a lot more terrain now and it's way better with it. So they had to have that. But yeah, six inch vertical coherency is a necessity. And almost. I think most of us kind of played it that way anyway, because 40k, we just kind of adopt rules. Yeah, it shouldn't just, have been. Yeah, well, there's a cliff, and you want to, you can't move up it until the whole unit can Either move up all it. Up there, so or... they couldn't ever get up it. But that means even like a one-inch little ledge, you all have the same level, unless you're counting a different level. Yeah, you had to keep them like this. To if there's a one-inch so, ledge, you had to. That's how close you had to be, so that base to base, because you're measuring base to base. Remember, not model. So it doesn't matter if the tall model, you're still measuring from his base to where the next base is. So it's a nice Vertical little addition. Version. It's yeah. a nice little addition, including most of us probably wouldn't have noticed it, but yeah, it's you, there you go. And then this uh, one. Kind oh, of this one I don't understand. Okay, this one confuses me. So uh, for flying models, any vertical distance uh, up and down is ignored when measuring a flying model's move. So we had that. I got to talk about 40k. We had that in 40k way back when, back in seventh edition, and it was a rider near the end, so that was no longer the case. So basically, I had a building to my hands this tall, and I have my dragon sitting on top of it, and I have a little, you know. Berserker down here, but Dragon has a one inch charge. We ignore vertical distance. Um, I don't like that, but I can accept it. See, I like it, which is funny because I was the one that hated it in 40k because there was things in 40k like the in 7th edition, the Tau battle suits, um, Where they assault can, move. Yeah, jetpacks. So they had jetpacks and they only moved six inches. So it was the six inch move ones that really bothered me. And we would play with a lot of tall terrain where a lot of people don't do that, so that's probably why they didn't care. And so you have this battle suit up here who would drop down his six inches because he ignored the vertical. He'd take his shots at something and then he would assault move 2d6 inches back up there and you couldn't get to him. But and I mean, do that over and over and over so again. So in our last game of Illarath in the vault, where you were playing Thamber Council, I was playing mostly Deepkin or entirely Deepkin? Mostly Deepkin. You remember. Oh, this is not much of a spoiler. There's not really a spoiler at all. You had a dragon on top of a castle and you charged down, I think, into my turtle. Mm -hmm. uh, that would have been probably a four inch charge, not the you know ten inch charge it was. Exactly. You like that? Yeah. Okay. Because it allows me to throw all that terrain on the table and not get ticked off that it's slowing the game down. But you could have jumped over the wall. I yeah, no, I, no, I, I, didn't, I, I, didn't I, this, I didn't have the distance to get over the wall. That's true. I ran to get up on the wall, and then the following turn, I was able to drop down and get so to him. So fly is that much more powerful, especially if you use terrain, and you should be using terrain because terrain's awesome. Yeah, I think it's, the reason I like an Age of Sigmar and not in 40k is because in 40k you have a lot more fly, yep. and you have a lot more ruins with the terrain being higher. Like the way we play 40k, there ends up being a lot more buildings Whereas in Age of Sigmar, the buildings are fantasy buildings, which typically are smaller. You know, I think you have an argument that you're, maybe, maybe I'll, give you, I'll give you this. Back in 7th, it was frustrating because there's plenty of things that can move after the movement phase. Exactly. In 8th edition, there really isn't. There's no, a few, there is a few, but I mean, there's, yeah, okay, all right, I can see, I can see the thing. I'm not going to lie, it still kind of throws it off for me. I like the true distance, but, you know, I'm not going to wreck the game. Yeah, and so far when I've me. played with it, it's been like, yeah, this feels good. This feels fine. I can see. I can see if I set up a certain table that had a lot of different height terrain, and they're all linking together. I might make a scenario-specific rule that overrides that, and it just instead looks like no, you just measure the distance from the, where the base was to where it is, and that has to be within its movement. That's what we do for 40k. Um, but for Age of Sigmar, I just I appreciate not having to worry about it. I think it's where it comes. So we're down holding to. measure tapes. You know, horizontally sort of on the yeah. angle. And, it just, and this lets you deploy more cinematically, lets it you move things around simpler more. simpler too. And yeah, and I'm not, well, I'm not one to shun complexity in a game. It's more I want to, I don't want a complexity for the sake of complexity. I, that, that, I, I agree with you on that. I don't know if I say this is that, but I definitely agree with you on that statement. <laughs> so shooting phase. Two changes here, both really cool. One is Ooh, good ones. the uh, you these can no longer ones. shoot out of combat. I love both of these. <laughs> so you can still shoot into combat. So there's two units fighting. You can still fire into that, no penalties. But if you are, and when I say in combat, the definition from when we say that is you have an enemy unit within three inches. If a unit has an enemy unit within three inches, you can only fire that unit at a unit that is within three inches. And it doesn't matter how far away the models are. So if you have the long unit, let's say there's these guys all along here, and there's an enemy unit right here, even this guy back here still can only fire at them. And that's really cool because it allows you to actually tie up some important shooting things with things that they don't want to be shooting at. And it does, it adds, see that one adds a little level of complexity to your tactics 
but not just for the sake of complexity. It actually is like, now I have a tool I can use to shut down something important to you. Well, so uh, people have heard me talk about this probably numerous times. If you recall, uh, when I talked about Age of Sigmar, the, the shooting in at a combat thing wasn't really a game breaking or changing rule for me. Because but there's it, less shooting in Age of Sigmar than there is in 40K. Well, it's just, like, it's just another rule. Like, okay, it's not, for me, it wasn't that big a deal. But it took me out of the immersion a little bit. Yes. This adds it back in. It seems to me that the fly thing was talked about. To me, it's just immersion, not necessarily a game thing. Rule-wise, whatever. It's more of an immersion thing. This one here is an immersion thing. Those archers are shooting at the guys they're fighting. I'm okay with that. It makes more sense. You know, they're not going to, you know... You know, jab this orc and then shoot a bow at his boss. Like, I think, like of, it. think about even Legolas in Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. When he was just sliding when he's, down. When he's sliding down and shooting guys, he's shooting guys near him. Yeah. He never. He was never firing far away. The only time that he'd fire far away is once he's cleared the guys around yeah. him. Then he could like help an ally. But he was always he'd be like take an arrow, jam it into the guy's face, fire it in the guy that's like three feet away from him. He he was doing shooting in close combat. And I know that's it's a movie, whatever. But it does. You're right. The immersion. It's, it's the immersion for me. So I can I can I'll picture the it. judicators, because you might say, well, they shouldn't be able to fire at all. But no, I can picture them. That yeah, it's, you're, it's a swirling combat. We're, we have stationary models representing a swirling combat. So these judicators are like some. One of them has got a sword out and slices another guy. As another one stands back and quickly draws an arrow and throws We've it into the guy. I do it. So yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So yeah, any of the any <laughs> movies with uh, like expert archers, they're using them in close combat, basically. Um, it's, it's same thing with like with like, like gun gun fu, where yeah. you're seeing the, the fight with yeah. with the guns. Like they you're, they're hitting each other and then they're shooting and they're hitting each other. Like but they're not shooting at a guy way way away usually. Not until he pushes them back for a second. Yeah, you exactly. Know, yeah. So that's really cool. It's a little change. It's like a it's a very subtle change, but it'll make a big impact. And it game. will add some tackle stuff. There are times I'm going to go run this unit at a unit of archers because I want if they're going to shoot, I'm going to have them shoot the unit. Yeah. I want them to take the shot. Yeah. Because they, they can mortal wound. It's like, you mortal wound my zombies. Yeah. Because you're going to, who cares? Oh. They have no armor anyways. Oh, I don't want my archers ever bogged. You're going to retreat more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Retreat's going to be a bigger thing. So second part in the shooting phase is Lookout Sir, which Boom. despite the name is nothing like Lookout Sir in 40K. True. It's essentially very simple. If you are shooting at a hero that is not a monster, that is within three inches of another enemy unit that has at least three models, you get minus one to hit them. It, I was hoping for something to protect characters in 2nd edition. And to be honest, this is not quite strong enough as what I was hoping for. But um, having played some games now and seen just how much a minus one can have an impact. For example, there's a lot of abilities that activate on a 6 to hit. And so when you're getting a minus one, all yep. of a sudden that ability does not get to activate against that hero. Funnily and enough, I just noticed it was a unit of three more models. Not yeah, it can't just be three or more models around. It has to be a specific unit. So you could have three units of two models near the hero. And it's he, not going to help him. He's not going to help him. Um, so yeah, so it's very specific that way. Uh, it doesn't care what the unit is as long right. as it's an enemy unit. So basically the hero, keep your heroes within three inches. Of your own units. Of your own units that have at least three models and you're in minus one to hit them. And it does make an impact. So not as strong a one as I was hoping for. But it definitely does you know, impact the game. No, it, it is. It, it was definitely needed. Uh, making them untargetable, like 40k. I don't. I don't know if I wanted that. I'm not a big fan of that. But I also didn't like seeing well, the first thing everybody did is go kill the necromancer, go kill the slang, go kill with your bows. Like that's also again it took a little, some of the immersion for me. Yeah, and on top of that, um, like I kind of would have liked something like the original 40k lookout, sir, which is after they've been wounded, you could pass it off. See, on like a four, I, you can get, you make uh, heroes on a four plus. Your general on a two plus. Often your general is a monster, anyways, and so you're this gives a little more power to your opponent instead of your, yourself. Like he can choose to shoot at you, your your character at minus one or something else. Let him make the decision. Yeah, all yeah. of a sudden that star faded arrow. You're like, I'm hitting on a three now, and it's only one shot. Uh, right. Let's shoot that monster. Yep. Because um, I yep. know I get the two to hit. Because yep. single shot threes to hit are terrifying. I don't want my characters to be immortal. I don't want them to die turn one. I, exactly. think this, I think this might accomplish that. Yeah, it'll be that happy medium. You can still pick off characters, you can still focus on them, but you're going to have to pay for it. We all know single shot, hitting on three difference anyway, so... Ugh. Hitting on two probably will. Yeah. <laughs> so, one little change in the combat phase. I'll let you talk about that one. Oh, this is a good one. So, piling in. So, no longer you have to pile in and get closer to the enemy model. You have to be at least as close to the nearest enemy model. 
So that means uh, once you're base to base, you can keep on moving. You can keep on sliding. Get get more malls in. That's gonna be a big one for for big horde type units where our they games start, showed up big time. Start sliding around. Like you go in, make contact, start sliding around them. The model get more models in constantly. It's a, a fantastic uh, addition to the game. I think. Yeah, so picture a big monster, and you charge it. Normally, you're like, okay, I got to stay half an inch away so I can pile in a quarter inch. Exactly. But then I lose my second rank because I'm on 25 millimeter or yeah, 25 millimeter yeah. bases. And I have a one inch reach. Now, from what I see, a lot of things are changing to 32 millimeter, anyways. But still, there there's that consideration. Now it's just like it feels a lot more free. That you still have to pile into the closest model, but you don't have to. A end big closer part of the game him. was previously uh, when to make base contact. It was usually, it was often, always, but not always. Now it doesn't really matter. So that part of the game is removed, but it allows for blobs of guys to get in better. Because let's be honest, um, blobs of Twenty anything weren't gonna weren't there. You weren't taking twenty to kill. You're taking twenty for their extra bonus. But now they can actually get attacks in. Now those twenty guys are maybe worth more than the dragon, exactly. which was still dominant. Which was like monsters were just dominating over infantry. Exactly because they couldn't get that wrap around. Really, yeah. well. it took turns to get the back guys to wrap around. Because as soon as the back guy was touching the guy in front of him, he's like, "Well, yeah, if I move, if I if, no, no, if I move, I'm not closer because I can't get closer." Right now it's, it's like, closer. "Oh no, we're good, we're good, we're good." So not only can the front ranks move and fill in, the second ranks can also get into better positions as well. Also, little things that I noticed in the games that we've played, uh, you charge something, and it was a lot easier to wrap around and then fight something else. Yes. And so that added an le- extra level of tactics of things that you have to think about as well. Yeah. I like that change. I and do. at first, when I read it, I'm like, oh, I wonder if that's going to get FAQ'd. But they did, on the Warhammer community site, put a uh, one of their rules highlights, yeah. and they talked about this, and they talked about how, hey, now you can do exactly what we're talking about. So that's not a mistake, or at least if it was, they're owning it. <laughs> who knows? Well, I mean, it's it's, it's gonna those of us who played the the actual movement part as their main tactic, it's gonna it's gonna change it for us. But I think ultimately, there's, there's more pros than cons for this one. I like it. It was a good good addition, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. So um, battle shock phase. There's a really cool addition. Oh, right. It's not really technically in the battle shock phase. It's after. It's at the end of the turn. Split units. In other words, at the end of every player turn, if there are any units that are no longer fully in coherency, you have to kill models from it until they are. And I know this is going to be huge in tournaments. I love this. When I walked around the tournament, the Age of Sigmar tournament at Adepticon, I saw everybody using this tactic. I saw people using these movement trays, which is, I don't don't like movement trays, but whatever, it's a tournament. And where they perfectly spaced them an inch apart, ran up, and charged in, and then when this guy was fighting here and this guy was fighting over here, they were killing models in the middle to maintain fights on both sides. You can't do that anymore. Well, yeah, you can, but at the end of the turn, you're going to have to kill some of those until they're all in coherency. And so we've been, I've been noticing you have to be a lot more careful which ones you choose to kill so that your opponent doesn't all of a sudden... So you're not going to take a unit of uh, you know, 60 zombies or Skaven slaves or whatever, run them up, engage five things, but chain them back so one's close enough to a character for a buff, and then kill all of them up there and leave the one way back here to keep your buff. While the rest of them are all While stuck the up there. Up the, yeah, it's like, yeah, I, get, I can't pile in because I won't get to coherency, but you, I still get my buff. And your turn, you're in coherency or you're dead. Yeah. And I you don't have it. to choose which one. You kill models until you're in coherency. So if you had one model back here and five up here, you could kill those five if this guy's holding an objective. Or doing something one. important. Uh, so you're, it's your choice it's, still. So you could still kill from the middle and then at the end be like, okay, I'll decide now which ones I'm going to kill. So there's going to be some more nuanced tactics. It's another immersion thing without you know, breaking the system, not gaming the system. Yeah, and I've already seen, once again, all, in my first dozen games, it came up almost every game that now, people were splitting their units. There are plenty of people who just wouldn't do that anyway. Because you just want to, you know, feel you, right? Yeah, you want to do the immersion thing. I, I, I try not to do it. Like, yeah, but your times. banners and your musicians, all of a sudden, where they are, right, becomes so a lot more key. I might have to kill my banner because if I, I don't want to, yeah. So you, or yes. thirty-two millimeter bases. If you have three of them and you kill the one in the middle, those other two are no longer an inch apart, and so you've got to kill them from. Basically, you're going to see that most of the time you're going to be killing from the outside moving in. You have three malls left. You have your champion, your banner, and a regular guy in the middle. Like, oh, you got, I got to kill a banner gotta or kill a champion. Ban- Oops. Yeah, exactly. I moved them wrong. <laughs> or how do you predict all of that? Like, it's it'll be. I'm putting the banner, banner musician, uh, sergeant, like, in one left triangle, always together. Right, but then you have to still. Maybe you won't want to split to there. Maybe you'd want a really extreme keep on the one side. 
It's yeah. hard. It'll it'll be impossible to fully predict. It's a it's a you know, it is not as minor as my people many people may believe. This is an extra level of thinking you're gonna have to do. Yeah, it came up in our games already. I didn't. We never had to kill anything, but it, it really influenced what we killed, yep. and it changed. I was like, oh shoot, I, you're right. I have. I there was one point I'm like, yeah, I have to kill my banner, because either kill my banner and lose that plus one bravery or whatever the banner's giving me, Usually or lose four other guys that yep. are no longer in coherency and keep my banner. So small thing, big change. But yes, exactly. <laughs> um, attacking has changed uh, in, one, in one way. And we'll let you cover well, that. Well, I guess, okay, so uh, in General's Handbook... This is a big the, deal, this is a big deal. Well, in General's Handbook, we got introduced the rule of one. Only in match play, though. Oh, that's a good point. You're right. And yes, you're absolutely right. So yeah, so in match play games, a one to hit, to wound, or save was always a fail. No matter what your modifiers were. Uh, that is no longer in a match play rule. That is a core rule in the game. So that's open play. That's narrative play. Yep. That's a core rule of the game. And they don't even that call the rule one though. anymore. It's no, they don't call it. They just, they just, just wrap, attacks. They just, they just folded it in when they're talking about hit rolls. Ones always fail. Wound rolls, ones always fail. Oh, and sixes always succeed. Save rolls, ones always fail. They don't say sixes always succeed there, thankfully. So if you don't get a save, you don't get a save. So I think that's a big deal for somebody like me who plays a lot of narrative. Uh, every time when I'm playing 40k narrative, I'm always like, okay, I'm playing narrative, but we're going to use these match play rules. Right. You'll actually see that all those match play rules are now actually no longer match play rules. In fact, can you think, besides the pitch battle profile, are there any match play rules that are now still match play rules in this book? What did you have? You had the rule of one, which actually covered a few things. I guess base to base thing was a match play. I believe it was a match play in the match play no, section. No, it was a match play section. No, it was in General's Handbook oh, as a handbook. suggestion, as a house rule. So the rule of one covered ones automatically failed for hits, wounds, and saves. What else? The rule of one covered also that you can only cast the spell once. Uh, was this match play? What the cover? Yeah, I don't remember. Monsters could. I think. I'm, I think that was FAQ'd pre- or, no, 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 or general no, no, no. handbook. I, I have. I'll look it up. I'm pretty sure cover for monster. It just doesn't matter. But I think cover. Uh, was only match play. You couldn't get cover for monsters. Yeah. Now, okay, that's another little change. Monsters or war machines that have. Eight. You know what? Actually, I think it's both monsters or war machine keywords that have a wounds character yeah, eight or more. So if you have somehow had a monster with less than eight wounds, which is the one that yes, that's how it was before as well. But who had eight? Who has eight wounds and is a, or seven wounds and is a monster? Uh, they're pro- I, I, they're probably because the smallest model I've seen that's a monster is a demon prince and it has eight wounds. So monsters and I think war machines are new though. War machines don't get cover if they have eight or more wounds, um, no matter what the situation is. So the other match play thing was the rule of one that you can only cast, in, in, in open play, you could have three wizards all cast the same spell. The same wizard couldn't cast the same spell twice, but three of them could. Now, that is no longer a match play rule. That's just under wizards, casting spell. You cannot attempt to cast the same spell more than once in the same turn, even with a different wizard. That's just in the core rules. And combine that with the fact that Arcane Bolt and Mystic Shield both suffered a bit of a nerf. I'm not going to find it. That's okay. It's not a big deal. Arcane Bolt. Oh, no, no lo- sorry. You found it? It what? is, yeah. So yes, this is a new one. So previously it was match play, monsters can clean cover. Okay, so now they so, wrap that into the main rules. Yes, so, and War Machines. So to answer the question, match play has changed in that all those rules are now just in the main rules. Yeah. So match play hasn't changed a lot. It's just but the main open rules. and narrative now incorporate all those match play elements. So Arcane Bolt used to be D3 wounds. Uh, now it's one wound or one mortal wound unless you roll 10 or higher. 10 or higher. 40k players, it's not more than 10. It's 10 or higher for this one. It does D3 mortal wounds, which is a serious nerf, Yeah. which is nice, because before it was just like, well, uh, Arcane Bolt's better than this other thing that I do. That, that was the problem. So so Arcane Bolt was often, I far too it. often, better than your standard spell. And there's a lot of spells that do D3 mortal wounds. And, but usually and and another effect, but they're like usually, one or two more higher to cast. Right, so you're like, do I want to do a five casting value of five and do this D three mortal wounds, or do I want to do casting value of seven and do D three mortal wounds and they get minus one bravery? And they always went for the casting value of five. Exactly. Now it's like, well, no, 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 I want the D three mortal wounds because I have to roll ten or higher. Now, if you're somebody like a weird knob shaman who's got twenty orcs nearby yeah. getting plus two, totally arcane bolt because then that's a better chance of getting that. Oh no, actually, no, not even because he's got better spells than arcane bolt now too. Arcane bolt only ever did one wound anyway. We've already used Arcane Bolt in our, in our <laughs> games because I had nothing else to do. Yep. It wasn't a, this is better than, it's more like a, really don't want to use these, so might as well Arcane Bolt. Yep. So that's changed there. 
And the other one is Mystic Shield, which I'm glad for this change because it was way this too powerful. A, I love, this is my favorite change in the whole book. All right, then you say it. Uh, Mystic Shield is no longer plus one to your saves. It is now re-roll ones. That's huge. The Mystic Shield was such an auto-cast every oh, it turn. It was annoying because even yeah. I did it too. And I'm like, I want to do this, but... But Mystic Shield. Once you throw it on the Gash, Archeon, or I think Tree Man, again. anything, well, anything really, anything with a three-up save, it just became frustrating. Heck, you give it to guys with five, like a big unit of Marauders of Chaos. Here's my forty Marauders of Chaos. Four save is big. And uh, by the way, I just cast that one spell from my one cast sorcerer that lets him reroll ones to save. And I got my guy nearby that lets him ignore wounds on a five plus. Now I'm going to give him Mystic Shield. Now it's a unit with a four plus save. Like it was come too power. On. It was too powerful. Way too powerful. Or Worries of Chaos. If there's enough, if there's at least twenty, they reroll ones to save, and they have a four up save. So now it's a three plus rerolling one. Now you, Mystic Shield won't do anything for them. Now this spell is like I really need this unit to survive. I'm putting it on him. Or uh, nothing's in range for my damage. I guess I'll cast. You know, I'll put a little buff on somewhere. Yeah, it's a it's same as Arcane Bolt. It's like a I guess I'll use it. It always is useful, except for an army wide. If you have an army wide rerolling ones like um, Sylvaneth, if you use your one command ability, which your tree lord yeah. gives everybody reroll ones within ten inches, then maybe he'll be like, well, I'm not even gonna do Mystic Shield because yeah. who cares? Well, the thing is, the 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 uh, what's the word I'm for? The core spells shouldn't be the end all be all. No, and they were all ever used. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, 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 Exaggerating here, but Mystic Shield, Arcane Bolt, every game. No, I saw it. I saw it. I was like, I play against Luca, and he's got his Vampire Lord with all these really cool spells, and he's just Mystic Shield yep. on my on did. my skeletons. Mystic Shield on my Grave Guard. Mystic Shield on my skeletons. Mystic Shield on my Grave Guard. I'm just like, this is boring, but I get it. So the free spells are useful. They are by no means garbage. They are useful. No, reroll not, ones is great. It is. Reroll I mean, ones it's is gonna great. Be a spell cast when they're often. You know, I just want to. I just want to see other spells being cast. Exactly. Now with I'm assuming combining this with the malign sorceries. And how there's going to be a ton of new spells. Um, I think whole that whole separate conversation right there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that this is going to combine really well. That you will barely see Mystic Shield and Arcane Bolt, except as a and now that you can only cast it once. And you're um, getting more spells from the realm you're playing in. Like, yeah, exactly, each realm. Get, if you're playing in the realms. Now the other big change to casting spells is now unbinding now is 30 inches rather than 18. And and no line of sight is required. That's huge. Yes. That's big. Yeah. We're actually unbinding spells now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I noticed that in our games. I'm like, oh, I actually have to consider that you have three wizards and you can unbind. I got to pick spells. up dice in your hero phase now because you're going to be in range probably. I, and and I don't I need like to see that. you. Yeah, I, of and course. I like that. I like the fact that you brought your heroes on the table. What was it in fantasy? What was the range? You just have to be table, on the table, right? Table. Yeah. You just had to be on the table because you could, you could, you could. It's a freaking uh, wizard. He doesn't have to be five feet away from somebody. In fantasy, dispel. Well, you can dispel without a wizard. Right. He's got his wizard level bonus. Yeah, it was a table. Right, exactly. Yeah, you just you just try to dispel it overall. Uh, it's unbinding now. That's a bit different. I think because I think the spell is going to be used in other things, but mm. um, um, well, for the endless spells, yeah. I believe that's where they're going to be talking about dispelling because you don't unbind a endless spell. I believe we have. I haven't read that book yet. I believe that you dispel it by giving up one of your abilities to cast a spell. Is how you're going to get rid of endless spells. I think. Okay. Yeah, different discussion. Yeah, we might be wrong there, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Um, I think that's it. The the train rules basically stayed the same. They add, they brought in the How garrison do you rules. Feel about the terrain? Are you ever going to use that? Nope. Yep. It's but com- yes, com- yes, but yes, because some of the war scrolls for some of the scenery says this one has the deadly rule. Sure. And so then I'll have to reference sure. it. <laughs> yeah, I'm never. I, I just. I, but I'll I, never roll for it. I don't think anybody's going to. This is back. See. What was it? Again, 40k back in seven, the same thing. Warmer fancy forever. I stopped using Mysterious Train for a while, then people complained, and I so I, I'm like, sure, I'll use it. And it but it was more rolls than it just didn't matter it, half it, the time. So for, it, it's so much we put so much train table when you sh- and you should. Then you gotta remember what everything is, and then you're gonna forget, and it's gonna. Eh. Well, and I, I watched you. I saw your guys' first Age of Sigmar games back when it first came out, and you had a little die on every piece everything. of terrain, and I'm like, that's so ugly. It's like, what is so ugly? Again? Now they're coming out with a die set. <laughs> With that the look, that, that with the symbols and yeah. a little number, so it looks a little nicer. But you're still gonna have a die on every single piece of terrain. No way! No, no way! No. So no, I'll never use these in the sense that I'm just rolling randomly for each thing. I might borrow them and be like, "Hey guys, see this lava? It's all deadly." Yeah, yeah, oh, 100 percent. It's something that you can be like, "Okay, all of this on the table is this." Or what if every train was on this table, inspiring for whatever reason? We're in our old ruins. Yeah, or arcane. Like so yeah. wizards are just like casting. Like I mean, there's even some realms of. 
uh, realms of battle that does something to all the pieces of terrain. I'm okay with that kind of stuff, but if every little yeah. of your 20 pieces of terrain is something different, it's being, you know, bogged down the game. Exactly. And I don't, yeah, if, if you, like all ruins do this, all trees do this. This section that's essentially fine. doesn't exist for me. <laughs> well, it's, it's there to reference because other War Scrolls will reference it. They'll say it's arcane. Like, Sylvan of the Wildwoods are, are deadly to not monsters or heroes if they run or charge. Something Basically. Like this one is just well, actually deadly's mover charge within an inch, so it's dead. It's not actually no. deadly. So that's why they have it written out. But like arcane ruins have the arcane special yeah. rule. The um, some things have the deadly special rule. Some things have the inspiring special rule. So that's where we're going to use that. But that's a, that's that's kind of a, a minor side note to the my, whole thing. My, and, I, and I love terrain, but I don't because I love terrain. I can't have them all having special. I'm not rules. playing with any inspiring hills. Heck, yeah, exactly. Heck, half the time that I've used a cast red hole, I even ignore the entire war scroll. Because I don't feel like it's not what the game was about. If I was playing with them like as a siege this cast dreadhold, then I'd bring in their war scroll. So half the time I'll plop terrain down and ignore its war scroll, with one exception, that being the obstacles, that if you have your entire unit within one inch of an obstacle, so something that looks like a wall, if they're on the opposite side of somebody shooting, then they have cover. That's the one I use a lot. Because it's often in War Scrolls. I didn't even know that existed. Yeah, it's often in the War Scrolls. We were scroll. talking about it, this yesterday, I think? Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it didn't exist in the core rules. It existed in a bunch of the War Scrolls for the terrain. So all those hill, all those fences and obstacles but now we can just had the rule that if you're within an inch. Now they put that in the main book saying pretty much anything you could just use this for. That if it looks like an obstacle and your entire unit's within an inch of it and they're on the opposite side of the shooter, they've got cover. Makes sense. I like it. It's nice and easy. So that is the core rule book and all the changes and our opinion. A bunch of tiny ones that are going to be big impacts. It adds up. It adds already the two games that I've played. I've seen all these things add up. The game still feels like Age of Sigmar. It doesn't feel like a whole new game like 8th edition did towards 7th edition. But all these little things, it's like, yeah, I like that better. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like that better. Oh, yeah, that's better. Oh, there's this restriction now. I've got to remember that. All these things, it's like, yeah, this is, this is cool. It, it has enhanced the game for me, I think, yeah. which is nice. So that's the end of this video. You can go watch the Vault video where we're going to talk about our first impressions of our first games of Age of Sigmar and uh, how they went. There will be some maybe minor spoilers. No, we're going to try to keep spoilers out of that we'll one. We'll try. If you're not a Vault <laughs> member, you're still welcome to go click it and get a free seven-day trial. give you access to thousands of other videos that are in the Vault right now, plus all of the Age of Sigmar release stuff that we're going to be doing over the next while. So check that out. Thanks so much for watching. Happy Wargaming. <laughs>